Hello, the internet. Queeve slash CK McDonnell here. I hope you're well. Uh, so here's the thing. Uh, I was doing a, a lovely convention at the weekend and uh, I did a little, couple of cracking panels and then they had this thing where we were going to do a reading and uh, due to logistical issues, the reading didn't happen. But um, I, I practiced for ages doing my reading. I was really quite pleased with it. And I was like, I was doing it because Wonder Wife was away and the poor dog sat there through me running through it again and again and again. And they seemed genuinely very impressed, uh, mainly because I gave them treats. But my point is, I had actually uh, prepared reading the first chapter of, wait for it, uh, the fourth book in the Stranger Time series. So that's right, it, it's called Relight My Fire. It's going to be coming out at the end of January. It's kind of being edited and stuff at the moment, but it has been written. I'm very pleased with it. Um, and I wanted to read the first chapter uh, of that, and I thought... Well, I didn't get a chance to do it the weekend, so I might just do it now. Now, don't worry, this contains no spoilers for any of the other Stranger Times books, or indeed life in general. Uh, so nothing will be ruined here except possibly your perception of me when you realise quite how clumsy I am at reading my own stuff. Um, people are always asking why I never did the audiobooks myself. I think after you've seen this, you'll realise why Brendan MacDonald does the Stranger Times books and the equally brilliant Morgan Jones does the uh, Dublin Trilogy, Bunny and related books as well. But, you know... I prepared for this. I feel like I owe it to the dogs, if not myself, to do the reading. So this is going to be the first chapter of Relight My Fire. And uh, I'm going to have to pick it up. So you'll get to see, uh, it's going to be very exciting. You'll get to see a man not look directly at the camera as he has to read what is in front of him on the page. So, um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to record this. If it's absolutely terrible, it's never seen the light of day. But uh, if it isn't, uh, you know, we'll, we'll go with it. And um, yes, Relight My Fire, I think it's almost available for pre-order now. But the point is, uh, sit back and relax and enjoy a man making a Hamesby's own work. So here you go. <clears throat> Have a drink of water as well. That's this professional bit there. Oh, this talking lark's quite tricky, isn't it? Right. Chapter one. The thing about life is that it is fundamentally impossible. Not that Wayne Granger didn't believe in the whole theory of evolution thing. It was just that he'd realised we'd all been looking at it from the wrong end. We were the result. The result could believe in itself because it was self-evident. Nobody thought about it from the other end of the equation. Imagine being that single-cell organism however many million billions of years ago and somebody pulled you aside and said, All right, champ, I'm going to level with you. We need, to, we need you to get your shit together and fast because you and your descendants are going to have to evolve into sponges or something. Then fish. Then those fish are going to have to decide that water is so last millennium. Grow legs and go for a beach holiday. You then become mammals with nipples. Nipples are like crazy important and pretty fun. And then you're going to need to become monkeys. And then, here's the hard bit, stop being monkeys. Which is tough as it's clearly the most fun stop on the trip. But you've got place to be and things to avoid being eaten by because, oh yeah, did you mention, all the way along everything else has evolved into other stuff designed to kill you in like a hundred different why you don't go outside in Australia kind of ways. One of those evolutionary bros will be a T-Rex, which will be the size of a triple-decker bus. Which doesn't seem like a fair fight, does it? But don't worry, they'll all get wiped out in a mass extinction event. And, heads up, keep an eye out for those big boss moments too, and run away from any large, rapidly approaching bright lights in the sky, or massive sheets of ice heading your way. You don't want to be too hot or too cold. You basically need to Goldilocks the shit out of this, and, assuming you avoid that part of the evolutionary assault course, you need to pick up the pace, because Team U needs to be evolving into Homo Basic, who learn how to use simple tools. Like those lads in school who sat at the back of the bus, and the teachers pretended not to be afraid of. Then, eventually, you're going to end up evolving into man, proper man, with crocs and orgasms and iPhones and student debt. And one day you'll go to university to study film while trying to continue evolving by telling people to call you Zach. But Daniel Bloody Wallace from your old school will turn up and make sure everyone knows you're really a Wayne. So the point is, little single cell organism guy, that's the evolutionary slalom run you and your progeny have got ahead of you. And the question is, are you up for this? They'd have reasonably said, No thanks, that sounds like a total nightmare. Entirely impossible. And they would be right. From their perspective, life is so utterly, unbelievably improbable as to be fundamentally impossible. 
The thing is, once you realise life is fundamentally impossible, it is a wonderfully freeing thing. It being impossible means that the impossible is not impossible. Ipso facto, QED. Jeez. Whatever was in that tablet he'd scored from Dino was good. Really good. Wayne needed to write this stuff down. He'd be meant to take the tablet when they went out later, but he didn't like the idea of not knowing what was coming. He'd had an awful experience with vodka in sixth form college, and he really did not want to shit himself again. The social stink off that had not washed off. Daniel Bloody Wallace had only kept stum about it after Wayne had slipped him 50 quid, but it didn't feel like a long-term solution. He had been considering leaning in into it and becoming a total party monster, but he wasn't sure he had the constitution for it. Still, now he knew anything was possible. Wayne had always secretly believed, deep down, that he could fly. The old him knew that was nonsense. The new him was more of a free thinker. Wayne couldn't fly, but maybe Zack could. Mankind had been stuck in the mud for quite some time now. A bit of evolution was required and maybe he was the man for the job. Some small part of his brain was also aware that he was not the first person to take drugs and decide he could fly. So yes, he was going up to the top of a 32-storey building, but he wasn't going to jump off it. He wasn't an idiot. Doing it up there just meant distractions would be kept to a minimum. It felt like he was meeting the sky halfway. Dino had nabbed the security code for the roof when the window cleaners had been in a couple of weeks ago. The view from up there was absolutely mental. They'd gone up last Monday for a quick recce. Wayne stopped at the top of the top of the stairs, gathered himself and punched in the code. After a moment, the light turned green and the door buzzed open. This was a sign from the universe. It was behind him all the way on this one. He could feel it in his bones. The sight of Manchester lit up and laid out before him wasn't any less breathtaking the second time around. Up this high, how could you not feel like a god? With a gust of wind, the door slammed shut behind him. He looked at it. The first time they came come up here, Dino had wedged the door open. Why had he done that? There was a coat panel on this side too, wasn't there? He had a sudden sinking feeling that he might not have been paying total attention to everything Dino had told him. Along with Zack's strong, reassuring voice in his head, telling him he could fly, there was now another little, distinctly Wayne voice informing him he might be in this shit here. Maybe he should try to open the door now, see if he was in trouble in the unlikely event he couldn't fly. No, screw that, no negative thoughts. Only forward. Positivity. He positioned himself in the centre of the rooftop and closed his eyes. The razor-edged autumn wind whipped at his skin and there was a taste of rain in the air. He didn't recall there being any wind when he trudged home from lectures about an hour ago, but then again, he was 109 metres above the earth now. It was another world up here. A world of freedom. A world of flight. It's evolution, baby. He just needed to think flighty thoughts. There was no point jumping in the air. Jumping in the air was something somebody who was trying to fly would do. Wayne, no, Zack, already knew he could fly. He just needed to let it happen. His body would simply decide that gravity was more of a guideline than a hard and fast rule and would act accordingly. He stood there and centred himself. He didn't actually know what that meant, but he'd heard people say it, and it sounded like something he should be doing. Last Friday, that Zara chick who'd been telling them all about how she'd been into Zen and all that. Wayne had tried to bluff that he was too, but he needed to get a book from the library and really nail that shit down. Zen dude, or party animal, were his two current life choices, but he was leaning towards the former. He was pretty sure that achieving spiritual enlightenment would be a great way of getting laid. He slowed his breathing and listened to the wind. He had to become one with the magnificent, impossible universe. Reinvent. Evolve. Fly. As time ticked by, he was fighting to hold on to his positive state of mind. But the little voice, his inner Wayne, was back, pointing out to Zack that he probably should have put something warmer on than a retro Nirvana t-shirt 
if he was going to stand on a freezing cold rooftop in October in Manchester like a twat. He tried to ignore Wayne, but the longer he stood there trying to think flighty thoughts, the more his buzz was wearing off and the more wane he felt. His mind kept coming back to how the door had blown closed and how he didn't have his phone with him. Jesus, the code had better work on this side too or he was going to be in all kinds of trouble. They couldn't kick you out after just a couple of weeks, could they? That was assuming he didn't die of hypothermia first, of course. If he did, his mum was going to hit the roof. The roof. He was on the roof. He needed to get down off the roof fast and not tell anyone about this. And Wayne opened his eyes. Only he wasn't Wayne anymore. Wayne had been standing on the roof. Zack was now hovering above it. Wayne was earthbound. But Zack, Zack could fly. He reckoned he was a good ten feet above the rooftop. He glanced down at his feet, dumbfounded that they were floating below him. He tentatively moved the left one. Nope, it wasn't in contact with anything. Holy shit! Adrenaline surged through his body. This was it. This was it. He'd known it. He'd always known it. Impossible was just a word. He was Zack and he could bloody well fly. This had showed Johnny in his crappy guitar a thing or two. Best of luck dominating the next Hall's party now, closing your eyes while you sing Wonderwall like a bell end. And Daniel Bloody Wallace could jog on as well. Nobody would care that the flying guy had needed to phone his dad to pick him up and bring a spare pair of trousers because he'd defecated in the other pair while drunk. Not anymore. And this was going to get him laid. He'd been putting in the groundwork with Susan, but screw that. This was a game changer. Her best mate, the unattainable Zen Phil Zara, was now definitely in his sights. In fact, sod it. Why not both of them? Zack was nothing if not a convention-defying dude. The guy who directed the Thor movies had done something like that. He'd seen it on Insta. Two smoking hot babes at the same time in like a relationship type thing. Unattainable was just a word. Just like impossible. Words that did not apply to the Zack he now definitely was. It says something of the workings of the teenage male mind that a mere minute after achieving the dream of flight he was almost entirely focused on sex. Sex. So focused in fact that he was oblivious to his surroundings. His environment was irrelevant now. He had mastered it. He had made gravity his bitch. Zack turned his head, drinking in the view. The view he was now experiencing in a way that nobody in the history of the world had experienced before him. He was a legend. A god. He was probably going to meet Beyonce. Christ, what do you say to Beyonce? She was Beyonce after all, whereas all he could do was fly. He was not paying any attention to the wind or to the fact that it had been steadily nudging him in a particular direction. Eventually, the now teeny tiny whisper that was all that remained of Wayne made itself heard, and he looked down. He was now no longer hovering over the roof. He had drifted and was about 120 metres or so above Hume Street. His mind might now believe that he could fly, but apparently his bladder didn't share its confidence. A stream of rapidly cooling urine leaked down his leg. His belief dripped away with it. The thing about making gravity your bitch is that the bitch can bite back. There you go. That is chapter one. I think we can all agree Brendan MacDonald is not shaking in his boots. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, I might do some more stuff like this at another point in time in the future. Who knows? Uh, Let me know if you liked it or if you didn't. Either equally valid. Goodbye.